All right, we got a very interesting critical thought today. We're going to be returning to the topic of fail states. More specifically, with something that I'm trying to coin as the hierarchy of fail states. As in, a way of measuring how the different punishments you can levy against a player will affect their perception of the game and their motivation to keep going. And for more information, I'll include a link to a post that I have up on Game Wisdom, which should be, up, which should be posted by the time this video goes up. But if you don't know what the term fail states is, as I just said, the fail state refers to what happens when the player doesn't succeed in the developer's challenge. They missed the jump on a platform, ran out of health, uh, you name it, they didn't solve the puzzle, or anything along those lines. And similar to tutorial design, every game, no matter how complex or casual, has a fail state. Doesn't matter if you're designing the Dark Souls of Stellaris, Steel Panther's World at War Cuphead, or Gone Home, your game has a fail state. And as we're going to talk about, there are basically five escalating tiers of how the player can be punished for not succeeding. The first one is very simple, time. The time spent playing a game that you can't get back if you're unable to proceed. If I got stuck five hours into a 30 hour game, then technically I wasted five hours. With that said though, video games are obviously an interactive medium. And because of that, one of the advantages is that you're not really feeling that loss. As long as you're kept entertained and the game is moving along, if you get stuck at a point, you can still view the last 5, 10, or how many hours you spent as a positive. It only becomes a problem when the game essentially starts to become a grind. And as we said before, grinding is when the player is not able to make any real progress but they're still playing the game nonetheless. Now what's very interesting about time as a fail state is that we typically see it as the only one in very challenging games. Super Meat Boy, Kaizo titles, I Wanna Be the Guy, and many more. In these games, as long as you're able to keep reloading the level or keep reloading that section, the game lets you replay it as many times as you want. And this gives a very quick pick up and play feel. In Super Meat Boy, it doesn't matter how many times I die, I could spend, you know, 60 deaths on a section, I could spend two. But the game never stops or gets in the way of me replaying and trying to learn what I'm doing. Picture for a second if every time you die in Super Meat Boy, you have to wait 10 seconds before you can retry the level again. Or as we see in many mobile and free-to-play games, you know, the pay or wait system. That is certainly an element of a fail state. And when it becomes too much a time loss, it can become very aggravating to keep playing. Now, with that said, most games do not use just time, and they go with the second tier, and that is progress. Progress and time, the only difference is that when progress is a fail state, you are forced to repeat something you've already done. Pick a triple A game released in the last 20 years, and chances are progress is a part of that fail state. Be it something as small as going back to a checkpoint, repeating an entire level, or in the extreme case, having to restart the game. Now, when it comes to progress, this is where things get very tricky and philosophical. Because depending upon the kind of game you're making, you have to be careful with how much progress is being lost. For a lot of game developers, it's considered good form to always have a checkpoint after a difficult or meticulous or unique section, such as a stealth part in an action game, an auto-scroller, a boss fight, arena fight, something that is really designed to be one-off. Because you do not want the player to be punished to repeat something that they already did, especially if something that takes five to 10 minutes of their time. Now, the obvious exception to this are Kaizo games that typically have you run through many difficult sections to get to that ever-hidden or that oasis in the distance of a checkpoint. But here's a pro tip. If you're trying to design a game for the mainstream audience, don't look at Kaizo design as inspiration. But progression as a fail state is a little bit slower compared to just time. And it can also begin to rub players the wrong way. Again, depending on how much time is lost. 
if, for instance, every time I die, I have to take 30, 40 seconds to get back to where I was at, that can add up. Now, as we've talked about before, when it came to the issue of UI design and dead time, 30, 40 seconds or 10, 15 seconds, it doesn't seem all that much. But when this is repeated 15, 20, 30, 40, or even more times in a row, it starts to grate on you. Now, with that said, though, one of the major parts of progress is the fact that your state is essentially being reset to whoever it was at that previous checkpoint or quick save. So whatever items I had, weapons, health amount, you name it, is preserved. So I can just keep repeating it as long as I have the patience. Not so much for stage three of our fail state here, and that is resources. This refers to any game that has consumable elements that aren't recharged upon death. So potions, money spent on items, special buffs, you name it. And this is when we start to see something very important. When the player dies, they're not reset back to where they were at or sent back to zero. They're actually put a few steps behind. And this is when things can start to become very troubling. For instance, in Titan Quest I've been replaying lately, I have to make sure I have at least 30 to 40 potions before a major boss fight. Because if I die and that boss gets reset, none of my potions come back. So I will have to buy all those potions again. Or if we're playing a game that lets you buy like limited time buffs, the same deal. The point is, when you die, you have to spend time regaining what you lost. And that is time spent not progressing. And this is a major point, for instance, between Dark Souls and Bloodborne. In Bloodborne, your healing in its form of the blood vials and your bullets aren't replenished when you die. So if you get to a boss fight and you consume or use all of them up and you still can't beat the boss, you better have some echoes left over, I think that's what they are called from Bloodborne, to refill your supply. Conversely, when it came to Dark Souls, your Estus Flask always recharged upon death or visiting a bonfire. So I knew whenever I was going to fight a boss or a tough section that I could go all in on that fight and know that my resources will be replenished when it's all over. And for me, that was a major plus in Dark Souls column, and a negative in Bloodborne. But I'm curious, for any Soulsborne fans watching, what did you think of that design decision? Let me know in the comments below. But the point is, if you're going to have resources that can be drained or consumed as a failed state, make sure to make it as easy as possible to get those back. Have enemies readily drop health potions. Make the cost to buy them very cheap. And again, we could spend more time on that. Now, with that said though, tier four is when things get very troubling, and that is when power is a fail state. What I mean by power is that when you die, you are legitimately weaker than you were before you died, whether it's because of loss of abilities, loss of stats, or permanent debuffs to your character. Now because of that, not many games go with power as a fail state, but the ones that do can end up being very polarized. For instance, Let It Die is a really good example of this. When you die, your character's body, who has all the stats and all the money you spent on them, becomes an enemy that you have to kill in order to regain that. The same goes for The Mummy Demastered. Even Darkest Dungeon features power as a fail state. You lose all your characters in a dungeon, you've lost all of that. And what's very important to realize at this fail state is that the player will always be at a deficit when they come back. And that means they have to spend time to regain what they lost, and that's time not spent progressing. And what's worse, and this is what makes us very tough to do right, is that when the player loses power, if they die again, they're going to be further in the hole. And again, and again, and this can become a downward spiral for any kind of progression and can easily sour someone on their entire game. In Darkest Dungeon, for instance, we've talked before about how much of a grind it can be at the final parts of that game. Because let's look at this. If I lose a party in the Darkest Dungeon, first I lost the time spent in that dungeon, 
I've lost the progress I had on that quest, meaning I have to do it again. I've lost all the money that I've spent leveling up these characters, and I've lost the power that those characters provided, plus any trinkets I had equipped on them. And that is a lot of time that has to be regained. And again, if you keep dying and it gets worse and worse, you may just end up in a pit that you can't dig yourselves out of. And because of that, games that go for power as a failsafe can be very polarizing and very frustrating for a lot of people. Now with that said though, the fifth part of our hierarchy should be obvious by now, and that is everything. Meaning when I fail, everything gets wiped and we're sent completely back to the start. Now, with that said, though, chances are, if you're a fan of game wisdom, you know what games we're talking about. Roguelikes, any game with Iron Man modes, and so on. And here's the strange part. Games that are built on losing everything tend to be more fair, or the player is less likely to get angry about it, than they would be when power is lost. And... We're going to have a little bit of an impromptu game design quiz. Why? Why are people more accepting to lose everything than they are to restart or have to do something again, but at a deficit? Pause the video if you want to take a chance, but I'm going to simulate that by simping some water. So, see if you can figure that out. Go to water, right? The answer is this. Even though the player is losing everything at the 5th tier, they are still being sent back to a null state or a zero state. And most likely, if we're talking about roguelike, the game is going to be completely different for that next run. Whether it's something like finding different items in Diablo 3, or completely different levels and situations in The Binding of Isaac, or what you're doing in a game like XCOM. The point is, that even though you're restarting over, you're not going to be doing the exact same thing again. And this is why games that have the punishment of everything, or Iron Man, are typically built around random or procedurally generated content. The guarantee that the player is always going to be given some new surprise or some new way of playing. What The problem when it comes to power is that you're asking the player to do the exact same thing they just did, but do it weaker. And in a case like The Mummy Demastered, this can become game-breaking. Because how am I supposed to beat an enemy that is using my best weapons, has 8 to 9 or even 10 times my health pool, and I'm stuck with my basic health and ammo supply? It's just not really that possible. And again, if I die, then I lose those weapons. And again, and again. And this is why you have to be very careful with how you design your fail state. To wrap up today's critical thought, the fail state, again, no matter how core, hardcore, or casual your game is, is still an inherent part of it. Some games will downplay it, such as casual titles or games meant for the general audience. But if your game is going to be built around a fail state, such as Darkest Dungeon, XCOM, and the like, you have to understand just how the player is going to perceive losing and how do they mitigate that. Because again, when the player loses that sense of progression and that momentum, the game becomes a grind, and it can become torture to keep playing. And when that happens, they're going to most likely stop playing. But, again, as we've talked about with games built on challenging gameplay and integrated fail states, they all become, again, one cohesive whole that you have to pay attention to, and again, balance around. For instance, with Cuphead, when you die, you're only losing time, with exception of maybe the King Dice section. But just imagine if every time you die during a boss fight in Cuphead, you were forced to replay a run and gun level to get a token of some kind to then go and fight the boss again. That would get tiresome very quickly, and would push the game over into just frustrating levels of design. So let me know what you think about this hierarchy of fail states. Be sure to read the post over on Game Wisdom, but thank you so much for watching today's Critical Thought. If you'd like to suggest a piece for an upcoming vlog, let me know in the comments below. But otherwise, check back for more discussions here and on Game Wisdom, where we examine the art and science of games. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. 
check back around 10 Eastern for regular streaming. If you'd like to suggest games for me to cover or topics to talk about, let me know in the comments below. For a collection of my writings as well as weekly podcasts on design, check out game-wisdom.com. To support the Game Wisdom Patreon, you can find us on there on patreon.com slash gwbicer. A dollar will get you into our private Discord channel where we talk game topics and more. Five dollars will get you voting privileges for any major event, including the Saturday Night Grab Bag, Patreon-funded goals, and more. Thanks again for watching, and I hope you enjoy more videos here on the Game Wisdom YouTube channel.